Let's talk about the Chinese energy transition and some of the, the key highlights, because the numbers really tell a story here, don't they? And one of the things that we wanted to do with this report was bring as many of the numbers as we could into one place, because we haven't really seen anyone do that before. The thing is, when you brought all the numbers into one place, it's hard to remember them all because there's just so many. So uh, possibly one of the most interesting ones is what's happening to um, to, the, to, to the annual increase in electricity demand because every year electricity demand does go up. And so um, in the first half of this year, all of the increase in electricity demand was met by additional wind and solar uh, generation. Uh, and last year it was pretty much all of that, it was 84%. If you go back a kind of decade, it was about half of the demand increase. So you can see from that the, 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 the increase in the scale of wind and solar and, and what impacts that having. And, and you look at the chart and it's just going upwards in this nice exponential curve. I've interviewed your colleague Kingsmill Bond many times over the last uh, five or six years. And he has uh, made a point many times that, uh, that we're seeing now emerge in, in the, the data from China, which is that wind and solar will first take the demand, the demand growth. Mm -hmm. That's where they'll, and they'll, that percentage will gradually increase over time until it takes all the growth and then it starts eating into the existing, uh, in, you know, the, the fossil fuel uh, base, if you will. And I, I would say the data now says that we're at that point. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, it'll be a little bit bumpy. There could be a year when you have higher demand growth in China and fossil generation perhaps rises a little bit, but there are other years when it, when it falls. It depends a little bit on, on the weather. And the thing is, it's not, it's not just the generation either. I mean, if you just keep building wind turbines and solar panels, you don't build a system. But it's the investment in grids which has rose, risen again. It's the investment in storage. I mean, the storage volume's tripled it's being installed tripled in three years. It's an incredible rate of growth. So it's building the system that means you can actually maximize the use of all this wind and solar generation. Yeah, that's something that uh, we don't sp spend a lot of time. We spend a, a fair amount of time here at Energy Media interviewing American experts because they are modernizing their grid, re-engineering their grid, and you're hearing a lot about you know, uh, reconductoring and grid forming inverters and all of that kind of, you know, technical, uh, techno babble uh, that is of interest to engineers and nobody else. But China has not only done all of that, it's really leading the, leading the way. It's figured out the, the, re the engineering issues and now it manufactures the technology and keeps innovating in that technology to make it better and better and better while North America struggles just to get its head around the idea that we need to do it. Well, if there's one figure that our analysts turned up that really had me raising my eyebrows, uh, it's the one that um, now Chinese companies lodge about 75% of all clean energy patents around the world, which is up from just 5% in 2000. I mean, that's a startling race of growth. And, you know, it's not that Ch so China is the factory, but it's also the science lab. It's the place where all this innovation now is happening. So this old image that probably still a lot of people have in Europe and North America as, as China just producing sort of cheap knockoffs of Western innovations. That absolutely is absolutely not true. No, no truth in that anymore when in clean energy. I often get American, um, you know, clean energy startups on here, and many of them come out of the university system. So we're talking, you know, smart people with PhDs. And I ask them the question, do you think the U.S. innovation ecosystem, which has been its strength for 80 years since the World War II, is, is the thing that will propel the U.S. and allow it to compete with China? And they, and of course, they very confidently say, oh, yes, yes, that's of course... And it's now emerging, we're beginning to understand that China's ecosystem is probably superior in this, in this area to the, to the American one. I think that's undeniably true. So why do, I mean, when innovation happens in a mixture between researchers and industry, and that clearly exists in China. There is this rich interplay of the, of the two. And perhaps in the US, the industrial side of that is, is a bit absent now. So you've got the sheer scale of companies in China, 
and, and that leads to some innovation, but it's also that they're competing against each other. And another misconception, I think, is that, that China is a monolith and, and, and you know, production is sort of dictated by some central bean counter. And it's absolutely not true. The companies are competing for, for market share and, and so on. And, and it is that that drives, drives innovation because, you know, innovation brings you profit. It's a, it's a message that any capitalist country should understand. Yes, and um, what the uh, the West sees as overcapacity, uh, China sees as uh, cutthroat competition uh, to see who will be, you know, the, if you have 100 EV companies, what will who will be the 10 that emerge uh, victorious because they're, they're better managed, they're hungrier, they, they innovate more, uh, they produce better, better products. And we don't do that in the West. Yeah, certainly in this field, that's absolutely not happening at the moment. Yes, it's an interesting categorization, isn't it, over production. Um, in a sense, you, you, well, you can turn that around and you can talk about under deployment. Um, and, and really, if, if, you, if you look at solar, solar, solar panels, um, certainly there is a case for saying the rest of the world is not maximizing the opportunity of this production volume for climate change targets, you know, for renewable energy target, the tripling of renewable energy capacity by 2030 that was agreed at the Dubai um, uh, Climate Summit a couple of years ago, for bringing energy access to the, the, the countries, the, the villages, the households that don't have it, that's the opportunity and it's there to be grasped. And, you know, we, we, we know that part of Chinese diplomacy is supporting those things. I mean, there are some Western initiatives certainly that will be supporting these things too. But overall, you'd have to say that we're not maximizing that opportunity. And probably that's partly because we're using the wrong word to, to describe it.